in live. Okay, let me welcome everyone here today to the Sakharov Seminar on Human Rights. This is our first semester, um, the start of the semester, uh, first seminar of the semester, um, the uh, fall 2021 semester. Um, we were hoping this fall to have in-person events, but in light of the resurgence that occurred this summer, that isn't feasible. So we're still going by Zoom only this fall. Um, the event that we are holding today is related to a seminar, uh, or at least it's um, certainly on a similar topic to a seminar we had four years ago in person at the Davis Center, which dealt with the distortion of historical memory in Lithuania about the Holocaust. Um, that was given by uh, Ruth Ivanagaitar and her husband, Ephraim Zurov, um, who spoke about a book that they had co-published uh, recently that looked at how historical memory was so systematically distorted. Um, it's always been a topic of interest to me because my family were from Lithuania, uh, were from uh, Latvia, um, and there is a similar degree of historical distortion in Latvia about the complicity of locals in, uh, particularly Lithuanians, in uh, the systematic murder of Jews during the Holocaust, during the Nazi occupation. So today's seminar is a book I came across earlier this year, and I found it uh, fa absolutely fascinating um, and maybe infuri infuriating about the topic it deals with book. Um, I, I'm very uh, happy to welcome here Sylvia Poti, who is the granddaughter of a person in Lithuania, uh, long dead. He was executed by the Soviet authorities in 1947. I'm not gonna to preempt too much of the story because I want to give Sylvia the opportunity to recount it in detail. But suffice to say that her grandfather um, is revered in Lithuania today as a war hero and a struggler for Lithuanian independence. It's not to say he didn't struggle for independence, but there was a lot more to the story than that. As Sylvia discovered when she set out to write a biography of her grandfather and thought she would be writing about a war hero. But as she uh, went carefully through the evidence and amassed uh, documents and materials from personal, from uh, the family's own files and from the uh, archival materials, she discovered that in fact, the story was very different. And the title of her book, um, which came out uh, I, this year, um, which is the Nazi's granddaughter and subtitled uh, how, uh, uh, the, the, how she discovered that her grandfather was a Nazi war criminal, how I discovered my uh, grandfather was a Nazi war criminal, um, it, it encapsulates well the story that she is going to tell, but it is a wonderful story. She is a journalist and writer and it really shows up in the book. She had published two earlier articles that recounted this story, but the book goes into it in much greater depth and uh, really enlightens readers about what happened and her reactions and how it changed both her and the uh, discussion in Lithuania. So please, Sylvia. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, well, I, I grew up in Chicago in the 1960s uh, to a very Lithuanian family, so Lithuanian that I only spoke Lithuanian in the home until uh, I went to kindergarten. And uh, it was only then that I started to actually speak in English. And this is a point of pride for a lot of Lithuanians of my age, for our parents anyway, because they really wanted to uh, raise us Lithuanian. And really, as I was growing up, you know, one message I kept getting over and over is it's my job to help Lithuania now and in the future. Now, while it's um, occupied by the communists, and we hope that someday it's gonna be free. So I really had, this is a mission kind of uh, ingrained into me since childhood. 
uh, as I was growing up, I heard a lot about my grandfather, Jonas Nareka, uh, who was a World War II hero. And like Mark said, uh, he fought against the communists. So I usually heard his story backwards uh, from my grandmother, his wife, and my mother, his daughter. He uh, died in a KGB prison. He was tortured in this prison for about two years. And um, the reason he got in this prison was he was trying to lead a rebellion against the Soviet Union, which had occupied Lithuania. And he had a very strong desire, as did many Lithuanians, to remain free and independent of the Soviet Union. Uh, the Russians have been Lithuania's enemy for centuries. And there was always a lot of resentment among Lithuanians for always, um, you know, land grabs by the Russians and, and occupations. So uh, he very strongly wanted Lithuania's independence. He got caught by the KGB, then taken into the prison. And then at the age of 36, he had a very short life, but, uh, you know, really packed. Uh, at the age of 36, he was executed, two bullets to the back of his head, and then his body was tossed in a mass grave. And his body's still unidentified uh, to this day. Before he was in the KGB prison, he was in a Nazi concentration camp, also for almost two years. So uh, I grew up hearing how he was, uh, he fought against the Nazis and he fought against the communists, again, for Lithuania's freedom. Um, before he was the Nazi concentration camp, he was the governor of the second largest region in Lithuania, uh, the governor of Chaule. And this was during the uh, Nazi occupation. And I was told that he took this position to help Lithuania and that he was sort of uh, acting as a double agent, working for the occupiers, the Nazi occupiers, while he was doing all he could to help Lithuanians. Before that, he was part of this um, five-day uprising that Lithuania held against the Soviet Union, the first occupation. So Lithuania was occupied um, by the Soviet Union in 1940, freed in 1941, and then again, it was occupied uh, 1945, so and until 1990-ish. Uh, so um, during this five-day rebellion, he led the northwestern part of Lithuania, uh, Jamaitia, or the lowlands, in uh, the fight against the Soviet Union, and they won. They did get the Soviet Union out. But right away, uh, Germany came in and took over Lithuania. So this is kind of the rough story I had always known about my grandfather. And my mother uh, had been working on this book like 40 years. And so I grew up always, you know, having her talk about her father and, um, you know, talk about how she wants to write this book. The Lithuanian community here in Chicago expected her to write the definitive biography of the book. Uh, but then in the year 2000, she was only 60 years old. She got very sick and uh, ended up in the hospital. And at that time, uh, she called me to her bedside and said, Sylvia, you have to write the book. At the time I was a journalist and, um, you know, my first reaction was that I can't believe my mom is dying. And so I said, no, 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 you're, you're going to write the book. Everything's going to be fine. But I guess she knew how, she, how it was going to go. And she said, no, you have to. Everybody expects it. And so um, she passed on this legacy of her father to me and expected me to write the book. And of course I said, yes. And, um, and then she died. And um, I 
collected all the material that she had amassed throughout those uh, previous decades. And there are three bookshelves of archival material that she had. Just a lot of great material. Um, you know, when he was in the KGB prison, say what you will, the Soviets created transcripts of the interrogations. And so my mom had 3,000 pages of transcripts. There were 11 men uh, who, were tr who were trying to lead this rebellion against the Soviet Union. My grandfather at that time was known as General Storm. That was his nom de guerre. Really in the army he had gotten as high as uh, being a captain, but he was trying to lead this rebellion. So he gave himself the name of General Storm. And he was a lawyer also. And so he, he sort of took charge of defending these 11 men um, as part of the interrogation. So a lot of great material there of uh, what this rebellion looked like or was, was planned to look like because it never really took off the ground. Um, and then my mom, of course, had, and these I grew up with, I had seen all along, my grandfather wrote 77 letters to my grandmother from the Stutthof concentration camp. And these were like the most treasured items that my mom had from her father. On uh, 11 of these letters, he wrote a little fairy tale to my mom from the Stutthof concentration camp. And it's like a little allegory of what was happening to Lithuania. There's a witch in the fairy tale and um, the, the witch uh, was meant to be Hitler, I think. So, um, so just a lot of material. And then um, after Lithuania got its independence in 1990, it, uh, the journalists there started writing a lot of stories about my grandfather. And then a school got named after my grandfather. And then some streets got named after my grandfather. So um, anyway, after my mom died, I, I collected all this material and I'm just slowly going through it. And then, so my mom died in February, 2000 and her mother, my grandmother survived my mother, uh, by five months. And my grandmother got a heart, another heart attack, like her third or fourth. And then she was on her deathbed in July, 2000. And now I'm standing by her bedside and she says, Sylvia, how is the book going? And I said, it's fine. Um, I, I got all the material. I'm gonna go through it slowly. At that time I was 38 years old. And I said, I'm young. I'm going to get it done. I'm not going to let it go the way mom did. And I really thought I was giving her words of comfort. And instead, my grandmother says, don't write the book. Just let history lie. There's no need to dig around. And I thought, I didn't understand what she meant, why she would say something like that. And I said, of course, I have to write the book. I promised mom, there's no way I'm not going to do this. And she didn't like my answer. She rolled over in bed and faced the wall. And that was the end of that conversation. And um, I really thought at the time that she just um, wanted to give me a pass from writing the book. My mom had been stressed out over it and had gotten sort of nervous and emotional over it. It was, it, it seemed like a very big undertaking. And I think, and I thought my grandmother was just trying to give me a pass. Um, so then both of them wanted to be buried in Lithuania. And uh, so, the, so my brother who's in California and I decided to bury our mother and our grandmother in Lithuania in October. And um, on October 8th, 2000, my grandfather would have been 90 years old. So it was like turning into this 90 year memorial for my grandfather. And um, we go to Lithuania, we bury them. And then we go to, uh, oh, and then right after the burial, we go visit um, the Academy of Sciences, 
because they, they we had the funeral at the cathedral and then the academy of sciences is, is within walking distance and they had just put up a plaque of my grandfather there so my brother and i and a lot of other people who who were there at the ceremony came and you know we looked at the plaque and uh and then um came back to uh actually the burial so then then after that we um were invited to visit the school named after my grandfather and he's in the Jonas Noreka Grammar School in Shukone which is in northern Lithuania and uh, my brother and I are greeted very grandly um, the children are holding flowers and singing songs and it was it was very nice and um, then the director comes up and he says, oh, I heard you're writing this book about your grandfather that you took the project over from your mother. You're such a good daughter. And our, our country really needs heroes. And I said, thank you. And I said, you know, I was kind of going into my journalism mode. And I said, you know, as long as I'm here, why don't you tell me the story of how you decided to name the school after my grandfather? I had never heard it. And he says, well, you know, uh, before 1990, we had this horrible Russian name, and of course we wanted to get rid of it as soon as we could, and we wanted to give it a good uh, patriotic Lithuanian name, and your grandfather's name came up right away. He was born right here in this town. And I thought, okay, that makes a lot of sense, and, um, and I thought that was the end of the story. But then he pulls me to the side, and he says, but you know, I got a lot of grief over naming the school after your grandfather. And I said, grief from who? And he says, grief from the Jews. And I said, what could the Jews possibly see, say about my wonderful, magnificent grandfather? And he looked at me as if I should have known this, that this was just su such common knowledge. And I think that look devastated me just as much as the words that came next. And he said, he was accused of killing Jews. And I. And I, um, I was shocked. That was the first time I had ever heard anything like this about my grandfather. And I, I was completely unprepared for it. So um, I had the feeling of falling through a trap door, uh, like, like someone had just punched me in the gut. And um, it, was, it was a devastating comment to me. So the director noticed that I wasn't taking this well. And he says, but don't worry, that's all in the past. So uh, it's just communist propaganda. So then I came home and uh, to Chicago and I talked to my father and um, other members of the community. And I'm like, have you ever heard this rumor about Jonas Nareka killing Jews? And they almost everyone said, yeah, we heard it. And I said, what? And I'm like, how come I never heard this? How come nobody ever let me know about this? And they said, well, it's not true. It's just communist propaganda. Why would we talk about this? So um, so that's what I believed because I was Lithu a Lithuanian in Chicago and that's, that, that's how we all believed. And so that's what I thought too. And um, I tried to just kind of put it to rest. And I, I guess I was in denial over this, maybe for a good 10 years, which is one of the main reasons why the book took me so long was this whole psychological aspect. And um, I started going through all this material that my mom left. And I came across a couple documents, a couple things there. And uh, this was several years in already. So one of them is this Pakal Galvalyatova. It's called Raise Your Head Lithuanian. And it's a 32 page brochure that he wrote in 1933 in Kaunas, which was the capital at that time. And when I was, uh, Reading it, I, at first I thought it was just going to be like a patriotic brochure on how wonderful it is to be Lithuanian, something like that. 
And I was really shocked to discover that it's uh, very anti-Semitic. And he's basically calling for the boycott of anything made by Jews in Lithuania, saying that Jews are the foreigners, uh, Lithuania's for Lithuanians, and he's asking Lithuanians, if you're gonna buy anything, buy it from another Lithuanian instead of a Jew. Um, and so he basically was calling for a boycott. And um, this was sort of one of my big turning points on my grandfather, but I still, you know, the denial is strong and I still, uh, was looking at this closely and I, I know you can't see it, but up here in my grandmother's writing in pencil, it says, or 22 year old young man with an exclamation point. And I'm, it's like my grandmother's ghost came up to me and she's telling me he's, he's just 22. Uh, he, he probably didn't know what he was writing. You know, the whole, everybody was anti-Semitic at that time unfortunately and um he it's not like he called for killing of the jews he he just called for their the economic boycott so this doesn't prove anything so i sort of clung to that for a while and then i continued going through this archive and then i came across this book uh or massive slaughter in lithuania and in it, it has uh, several documents from the Holocaust in World War II. And one of the documents in there is signed by my grandfather when he was governor of that Chole region during the Nazi occupation. And this is the document that really turned me completely around. Uh, and then I started thinking about my grandfather in a completely different way. And he wrote it in August 22nd, 1941. And it's an order calling for all Jews and half Jews to be rounded up in that region of uh, Shole, which is the Northwestern part of Lithuania, and to be brought to a new ghetto that he wanted to be formed in a little town called Jagade, which is in Northern Lithuania. And they all had to be rounded up within one week. And so uh, over 2,000 Jews were rounded up, and then they were brought to Zagare. And uh, on Yom Kippur, within six weeks, they were all slaughtered. And so, you know, I was a journalist at that time, and this is a primary source document with my grandfather's signature on it, and I took it at face value. And I really wasn't reading that much into it the way many Lithuanians are in Lithuania and even here in Chicago. And so with my, you know, I think it's because of my journalism background that I really took it at face value as a primary source document. And uh, this is where, <clears throat> this is where I really began to think differently about my grandfather. So um, Mark, I think that's kind of the introduction for the book. and. Okay, very good. Thank, thank you very much, um, Sylvia. The, uh, I, I remember when I was reading the book, one of the things that really struck me is something you've mentioned, which was the comment your grandmother made to you about not writing the book. And I'm wondering, as you think back now, um, you know, at the time you thought maybe it's because she didn't want you to feel pressured and didn't want you to have it hanging over your head. But as you think back now, what do you think she meant? <laughs> well, she, you know, my mom was only two years old in 1941, but my grand, my grandmother was an adult. And so I think she knew, because she knew I was a journalist and she kind of knew my personality. Uh, and she sort of knew my stubbornness too. And, um, she, I think she was afraid I was going to come across this information and not let it go the way maybe some other Lithuanians would let it go. So that's what I think. I think I think she wanted to talk me out of doing it because she knew what I would find and she probably knew I wasn't going to let it go. Mm -hmm. 
did she did, did she at any point um and, and again i realized she was already very ill at that time but um did she at uh an elderly but um did she uh in at any point encourage you to have someone in lithuania write it or did she suggest anything of that to it no okay um no so let i think me... she just didn't want it written at all and and you know uh, my mom had spent so many years on this book that that and i don't i i don't know you know one of one of my suppositions is that my grandmother maybe played a role in my blocking my mother from really you know getting into the book too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so did, um as you were working your way through a large volume of material you have as well as uh speaking with people in lithuania um and elsewhere and digging into archives um as you began to change uh your view of your grandfather uh, how did how did the defenses how did you overcome those um, aside from finding that document that you've mentioned now at the end of your comments um, beyond that at what point did you begin to think you know this isn't looking too good um, how 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 is it that i can come to grips with this um, what was that process like for you it was very difficult and very painful um i mean it was like having a, a lobotomy for a lithuanian uh who was so patriotic and so proud of being lithuanian because it 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 turned upside down everything i ever thought about lithuania and so in that process it completely turned my own identity inside out of what it means to be lithuanian you know, at first I went through denial. So the denial was quite strong. And this is this is where I do identify with the Lithuanians in Lithuania and even those here in Chicago who are uh, so against the information in this book, because it it took me about 10 years and most people are just hit with it now in their first year. So it does it took it does take a long psychological time. And I was really though working at it because I was spending so much time on this book and um just to give you an idea how of how seriously i took this book i had been a journalist and i didn't have enough time to work on the book because i was writing for everybody else and i ended up switching careers and becoming a high school english teacher so i could have my summers off to write the book so i completely changed my career for this and um but anyway, after the denial, I once I came across that document, I I think I you know I went through a period of depression, and it was uh, a crisis of identity, and um, and then as a journalist, I thought you know, for you know before I I you know part of me wanted to just drop the whole project. But um, I was also thinking as a journalist, you know, I'm gonna have to really look into this. There's no way I can ignore this. And maybe I could exonerate him. This was before I found that last document on August 22nd. So after I found, you know, this brochure, I was, I was still thinking maybe I could, you know, dig into this Nazi period and just finally exonerate him once and for all. So that was my intention in really getting into the, the whole Nazi occupation. Um, then after I got over my depression and, and you know, the freak out period and the shock period, um, I had anger because now I was upset and angry that this had been hidden from me. And the more I kept looking into the Nazi occupation, of Lithuania, the more I was realizing that that Lithuanians were not as innocent as I had been led to believe. And um, in my mother's archives, there's so much in there about the two Soviet occupations, and there's almost nothing in there about the Nazi occupation. So even that alone was like, hmm, 
why is there hardly anything on those three years? And uh, and then when I really was getting into it, I'm like rereading my the letters my grandfather wrote to my grandmother from the Stuttgart concentration camp. And it finally dawned on me after spending hours and hours reading them. I'm like, wait a minute, how many concentration camp prisoners get to write letters home? There's not many Jews that were able to write letters home. And in the letters, he's saying things like he's getting packages and he's getting money and he's getting food. And he got, and he had, he and the 46 guys he was with there, they all got the status of uh, honorary prisoner, which is a completely different thing from um, the regular experience of being in a concentration camp. So even this had been completely distorted of his time in the concentration camp and how he was treated. And it was like uh, the, Lithuanian, the, the story used the typical concentration camp story and projected that onto what these guys went through as a way to show that they were anti-Nazis. And so that got me angry too. So when I hit anger, I finally got a lot of energy. And then that's when I really got down to business and started writing the story and, and getting it done. Did you discuss it with your brother and with other relatives as you were moving along? And what did they, what were their reactions? Well, my brother was very supportive. Uh, he and I are quite close. And we sort of had a very similar experience growing up, you know, listening to the stories of our grandfather from our grandmother and our mother. And um, he was there with me in that school when, when we first heard it. So, so um, as soon as I started writing the book, I was sending him draft after draft kind of showing it. So he's, he was very supportive. My father, not so much, at least initially. Uh, he just couldn't believe it. He didn't think it was true. He, he still was very firm that it was communist propaganda. And, you know, I listened to what he was saying, but I was already finding a lot of information. He, he just couldn't absorb it. He couldn't get it. It's only now in the year 2021, he read my book for the second time. And he was like, you know what, Sylvia, maybe you're onto something. So, uh, so I think he's converted, but that's just, you know, one after all these years. My Let other me family ask, members. I, I, wanna ask, I don't want to ask too many more questions because there are questions from the audience I want to get to. But the, um, the uh, one other question I do want to ask is how can you, um, or how would you weigh the reaction in Lithuania itself to your book? versus the reaction among the Lithuanian diaspora in the United, well, in the United States and other countries, but particularly the area, you know, the Chicago area. Well, there's like a very patriotic, I guess, nationalistic group of Lithuanians that are very, very proud of being Lithuanian. And, and I grew up that way too. And they're, to me, they're in denial. I mean, I'm getting a lot of hate mail from them. They're angry about it. They can't, they can't believe it. They're calling me a traitor. They're calling me a KGB agent. Um, there are some very supportive Lithuanians too, though. So I am getting support. It's very private. They're not going public. They're afraid to go public, basically, for the most part. Um, but one great thing is that in Lithuania, a publisher is publishing my book in Lithuanian. So that that book is coming out in January or February. So that, to me, is a good sign of support that that is happening. Okay, so let me, uh, if I can, Sylvia, let me turn to um, questions from the audience, and uh, I will go through, um, I'll go through them one by one and let you answer each. Um, first uh, is, as you were trying to uncover your grandfather's past, you surely heard stories about collaborators, meaning collaborators with the Nazis. Um, 
did any of these stories give you second thoughts about your grandfather? That, that is, I think that question implies earlier on, even as you were growing up, or, um, or were all stories of collaborators dismissed as communist propaganda? After 1990, were there any Lithuanians in Lithuania who also wanted to pursue the truth? I, I missed the very tail last few words. Were there any uh, Lithuanians in Lithuania who also who... wanted to pursue the truth? I, I think meaning not only about your grandfather, but also more generally about the extent of complicity in the murder of Jews. Well, I did not know anything about, you know, the collaboration. First of all, they weren't even called Nazis. They were called Germans among the Lithuanian community. So uh, there was some collaboration with the, with the German Nazis to fight against the Soviet Union in that five day uprising. That's kind of all I heard. And then I heard uh, Germany um, tricked Lithuania into this collaboration by promising Lithuania's freedom. And then as soon as they got rid of uh, the Soviets, Germany occupied Lithuania. So that's the only version I heard. But, and I, until I started looking into this book and, and my grandfather's story, I realized there's this whole other side to that five day uprising. And that where really my grandfather was collaborating with the Nazis. My grandfather was involved in writing a lot of anti Semitic letters and brochures that they were disseminating uh, throughout that region. Um, and that that was the start of the Holocaust in Lithuania. All I heard was five day uprising against the Soviets and I heard nothing about the Holocaust, you know? So, so it's like they were only telling a, a small part of the story. I, I, I wouldn't even say just half the story, maybe a quarter of the story because the Holocaust really was the big event that was happening. Okay, let me um, that, uh, let me get that that previous question was asked by Joseph Bradley. Now one from Shirley Saunders is, why was your grandfather in Stutthof concentration camp? Okay, that's a great question too. Um, he, okay, so in 1943, uh, there was the Battle of Stalingrad, and that, is, that was the turning point in World War II where the Nazis were finally losing and then the Allies were finally winning. So right after that, Lithuania started kind of showing its teeth to the Nazis and finally having the rebellion. So the only anti-Nazi rebellion only happened after 1943 and not a single Nazi died during, this, during the anti-Nazi rebellion. Uh, which I think needs to be pointed out. While at the same time, over 200,000 Jews were killed. But um, he was brought, well, then right after, right after the loss, uh, the Battle of Stalingrad, the Nazis wanted Lithuania to join the SS. Before that, Lithuanians were not good enough to, to become Nazis and join the Nazi party. Uh, but at that point, they wanted Lithuanians to join the SS. And Lithuania, to its credit, said no. And so uh, they even sent up, set, set up kind of this boycott campaign. And wherever there was, uh, you know, headquarters for people to, to join the SS, they would send like these old men with uh, canes, you know, limping in, into the uh recruitment center for joining the SS. And of course they were turned away. And so uh, in retaliation to this, the Nazis rounded up 46 men in Lithuania, kind of the leaders of Lithuania and sent them as an example to Lithuania of uh, disobeying the Nazis. And so they were sort of sent as hostages to the Nazi concentration camp. And this is part of the distortion story because their being sent to this uh, concentration camp was used as proof that they were fighting the Nazis 
on behalf of the Jews. It's, it was sort of left implied that it was for that reason, and it was not for that reason at all. Because by that point, most of the Jews in Lithuania were killed. Okay, let me uh, turn to a question. How much of, uh, well, let me actually reverse the order of these questions is, um, how is your grandfather viewed in Lithuania today after your book has been out? We've discussed this a bit, but can you say more about that, Sylvia? For example, um, have you uh, heard it all from that school official that you spoke to? Do they intend to change the name of the school? Um, other such um, things that you might have gleaned about the reaction in Lithuania. And, and I realize that um, the book hasn't been out all that long, so and isn't yet out in Lithuania. And so there may be only based on a somewhat distorted summary of your book at this point. Um, but what, and this is maybe more a question that should be asked after it comes out in Lithuanian, but what can you say at this point about that? At this point, in general, uh, I would say my perception is that most, Lith most Lithuanians are still against it. And uh, there's, you know, I'm getting, they're saying I'm not a historian and they're basically dismissing my research. Um, and they're saying, you know, I'm just the granddaughter and what do I know? And, uh, you know, I wasn't there and I don't understand how complicated the time was. Um, so basically just a lot of neg negative uh, views. Um, those at least that are public. And um, like you, you know, it's coming, the Lithuanian version is coming out in February, January or February. So we'll see how that goes because many have still not read it. Most are still reacting to the English version, version and not everybody's read it. And so um, there's still a lot of anger. I think there's a lot of anger and uh, hate toward me from the Lithuanians. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not as though um, accusations of Lithuanian complicity in the Holocaust are new. You know, this, that is, this, this book is shocking in uh, what it reveals particularly about your grandfather and, you know, the extent to which he's revered in Lithuania, even, even now, but, um, but the, the accusations of complicity go back a long while. And you know, there, there is ample documentation of it in places like the Holocaust Museum. So what do you think um, particularly about this case? Is it that your grandfather's legacy in Lithuania is so special or is it just part of a general sentiment that you know, there's this effort to discredit Lithuanian struggle for independence, which, which of course did occur, but it, it's just that that's only a part of the story. Yeah, I think there's a lot of factors that come into play. The, the fact of Lithuanian complicity in the Holocaust is only common knowledge among Jews in general. And so when I was researching the Holocaust in Lithuania, most of the research was done by Jews. And when I talk to Lithuanians about it, and I tell them that it comes from a Jewish source, they say, guess what they say? Oh, well, that's just what the Jews say. Like they dismiss the research simply because it was written by a Jew. And, um, and there, but, but there's barely any research by Lithuanians into it. And anyone who does try to do some serious research, even inside Lithuania, um, they get their lives turned out, t turned upside down. They lose their jobs. It's it's like it's like still living in Soviet times in democratic Lithuania to try to talk about this. Um, you know, people are, could, would lose their positions. Historians are afraid to talk about this in Lithuania because they're at the mercy of Lithuania. So I think I had the fortune of being an American and I'm not at the mercy of Lithuania. And so I think only an American would be in a position of power to do this. You know, you talked about Ruta Balagaita and uh, Ephraim Zero. They're not, they weren't husband and wife. 
by the way. They were they were colleagues, and I think they dated for, for a little bit, but they never got married. Okay. Um, Sorry. Sorry, I was told they were. I, I was mistakenly told they were. <laughs> they never so, told me. <laughs> uh, they only met for at this project, and then while doing this project, they fell in love. Um, and then, um, but but they're, they're they're not married. So anyway, um, she completely, uh, all her books got taken and uh, off the shelves. You know, she was a best-selling author. And then after this book came out, she said something on TV that I, I don't, I don't remember what she said. But again, she was talking about another partisan who fought against the Soviets. And he's a big hero in Lithuania. And she said he could have been part of the Holocaust. And because she said he could have been, just for that, like you can't even say this on TV in Lithuania. Everybody got so upset with her that they they took all her books off her shelf off the shelves, not just the Holocaust book, but all her other books. And um, and then she ended up living in uh, Israel for a while, and now she uh, now I hear she's back in Lithuania. So um, so hers is the most dramatic case, but um, if I you know I'm a high school teacher now. If I were a high school teacher in Lithuania, this I would have lost my job. But because I'm a high school teacher in the United States here, guess what my high school did? It gave me a sabbatical so I could go out and promote the book. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> sounds sounds like a good high school. Um, so let me uh, let me turn back to the audience questions. Is um, it's a couple of these we've now dealt with, but. Um, let me, uh, let's see. Um, one of them is when you grew up, what attitude to a Jews did you absorb from your family and the Lithuanian community more generally? That is, um, how did your attitude to a Jews evolve growing up in Chicago and becoming an adult, as well as w when you were then working on this book? I would say, that in general, uh, it was a negative view of Jews. That, um, you know, a lot of the anti-Semitic tropes I heard growing up about Jews. And um, if, it, if there was anything about the Holocaust, it was, well, they were all communists and they were all the enemy. In fact, that's what my father would say when I would talk about this, about Jonas Nareik in the early, in the early years. He would be like, well, they they were communists. They we had to, we had to fight against them. Um, so it wasn't until um, I started really working on this book and reading a lot of Jewish sources, and you know, and I, I after I started going to college, you know, I went to Northwestern University, and and then I got other degrees, and of course, I ran into many people from many diverse backgrounds and there were many Jews too and of course I knew that everything I I heard girl you know growing up everything I heard about Jews growing up was not true and so uh but I would say you know I grew up in a very nationalistic bubble and it was like that okay let me um let me turn to I, I was waiting because most of the questions certainly uh, reflect great interest. There is a one question reflecting pushback, which is, um, what if your grandfather was forced to sign that order about the 2000 Jews? I assume means forced by uh, the Germans um, to sign that order about the 2000 Jews. And despite it, isn't he still a great Lithuanian hero? Well, it wasn't just one document that he signed. While he was governor of Chole, he signed about a thousand documents connected to like administrating the region. And of those thousand, 70 have to do with the Holocaust. So 70 times they forced him to, to write something. And most of those are not translations from German. Most of them are just straight into Lithuanian because they had to do with, you know, very Lithuanian matters. Who gets Jewish property? Which Lithuanian in Shaolei gets which specific Lithuanian and for what reason? This was not trans, this was not from the German. The German had no idea who, who should get what. The other funny thing is um, 
he he wrote orders to confiscate the Jewish property of those Jews before they were killed, before that six week period. So the other argument is he didn't even know he was sending them to their death. He didn't even know what a ghetto was, which is also not true because he was in Plunga and that, and I could talk about that. But um, he he knew he knew what a ghetto was. Maybe many Lithuanians didn't. Uh, we're not clear what that was, but he knew as the head of the Shola, he was the highest Lithuanian possible under a Nazi. And at that time, he was not forced into that position. He took it willingly. He was very young. He was only 30 years old when he got that job, which is extremely young. The guy before him was in his 50s. And guess what that guy did? He stepped down. I think because he was in his 50s, he was wiser and he could kind of read the landscape better and he knew what was coming and he didn't want that position because he knew what would be asked of him. My grandfather took it. And at that time, my grandfather and family lived in the best building in Cholet. It's like the governor's mansion. And he was getting a thousand rights. This was, he had no gun in his head. He was getting paid. It was a salary. So, um, he was not forced to do anything. And all of a sudden, after the Battle of Stalingrad, he's fighting against them. He can stand up to not join the SS, but he can't stand up not to kill Jews. Why would he do that? Yeah, no, all of, all of those comments, I think, are very good, Sylvia. I would just add a couple of things. One is, as you have discussed both in the book and today, your, fa your grandfather had some very ugly ideas about Jews going in, you know, as was reflected in the publication you mentioned, which I took a look at and, and is indeed extremely disturbing. Um, beyond that, um, this issue has been examined in considerable detail by historians over the years, partly in connection with a book that came out from Jan Groth about you know, the, the massacre of uh, Jews in Yedvabna in 1941. And um, you, because similar arguments were made then, you know, is that they were forced to do it by the Germans. And those arguments have been discredited. I mean, there was, a, there was um, ample leeway for people not to slaughter Jews. So they chose to do it. Um, they were not punished if they didn't do it. Um, and um, so the, you know, the argument really doesn't have merit. It's also, I, I, one last thing to add about it is in Latvia too, there have been similar arguments is that the complicity of Latvians in the mass murder of Jews has been similarly dismissed. Um, I've looked into that myself and, and there is no credibility to the notion that people were forced to kill Jews. Um, it, it really is a baseless argument and one that tries to divert, I think, history onto the wrong path. Um, let me come back to uh, audience questions. Is um, Could you say more about the diaspora reaction to the book, Sylvia? Um, for example, our Lithuanian, our American Lithuanians in particular, um, Lithuanians, uh, that is of, of Lithuanian background, Americans of Lithuanian background, reacting any differently from those in Lithuania. We've dealt with this already, but, um, but because reactions in Lithuania are, will be more important next year, um, I'm wondering how do you think the reactions of American Lithuanians are shaping the reaction in Lithuania itself at this point? Well, in Chicago, there's a newspaper called Drogas, which means friend. And uh, the only articles they've written about my book were all negative. And, uh, you know, I, for me at this point, it's easier to get to, to, to get in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal than it is to, to get in this little Lithuanian newspaper here in Chicago called Drogas. So um, publicly, most are against it. Uh, now, and many don't want to read the book because they just don't believe it. The few who have talked to me who have read the book, uh, it did change their mind. 
it did change their mind. There are some who, who did read the book and they don't believe it or they discount what I found or they belittle what I found and there's still the denial is strong. So, you know, my experience is still most Lithuanians are against it. Um, there are some who express to me that they do support me, but so far it's been very private. Uh, there is one, one writer in Lithuania who actually used to live here in Chicago, ended up writing a positive thing about the book. So there was one. And then there is another uh, Lithuanian radio television, like the, there's a newspaper there. They're generally pretty positive and neutral about it, I would say. So, so that, that is true there too. Um, I don't know. So, some, some tell me that Lithuanians in Lithuania will, will uh, embrace this more quickly than the diaspora. It's like the diaspora is kind of stuck, you know, with the way things were. And Lithuanians in Lithuania actually live with it day to day. So, so they can kind of shift a little more quickly. It's been explained to me that way anyway. So I don't know how it's going to play out. Yeah, there is a phenomenon among diaspora communities, not just Lithuanians by any means, all diaspora communities, a kind of long distance nationalism that can sometimes be more intense than the feelings among people who actually live in the country. But um, again, I'm not implying that that's necessarily what's going on here, but it, um, but it, it certainly has been the case in other uh, diaspora communities. One um, question, Makes sense. your mother, um, do, do you think it, as she was, you know, she had worked on this for a long while. Do you think that she suspected the truth as well? I've given this a lot of thought. I think she came across the, inform I, the information I found because it was in her archives. So she saw this. Uh, but I think she must have just gone into denial even after seeing it. And... Uh, Denial is very strong. The evidence could be there right in front of you, but if you want to see it a certain way, you're not you're not going to take it at face value. You're constantly it's like they're constantly making excuses, you know, like like that um person who asked the question, wasn't he forced to write that document? They they're all like that. The ones in denial are all like they just cannot accept it at face value that he knew what is that he knew what he was doing. They all have to make excuses for him. There's no evidence that he made excuse. There's no evidence of how he felt or what he did, but they they act as if because they're projecting what their own feelings are onto it, and they just will not take it at face value. Um, so the, here's a question that says a painful, troubling book on a tragic part of Lithuania's history. A few problems with your work: the book title. The comments that you would lose your teaching job in Lithuania now if you discuss the book's topic. Um, do do you uh, not sure exactly what the question means? The book title. So can I know you what it means. On how you chose the title. Um, I, I mean, I think that the, the the book's title and the subtitle sum up the book very well. So I'm I'm just curious what you how you chose the title. That wasn't my title. My title is uh, was Storm in the Land of Rain, and um, my publisher chose this title, and I did not like it because technically my grandfather was not really part of the Nazi party, and I pushed back against, uh, against this, but the publisher thought, you know, it would be a stronger title this way, and um, the word Nazi, you know, there's deep, you know, I'm going to go English teacher on you, denotation and connotation. And so the denotation of Nazis belonging to this nationalist socialist party, yes, he did not belong to it. But now the connotation, I mean, people are calling each other Nazis left and right, and they were never part of the, this, you know, Nazi party. And so, uh, but my grandfather, although he never wore the uniform, he never had that membership card, he never had any Nazi pins or anything. The worst, the worst thing about being a Nazi is killing Jews. That's the worst part of being a Nazi. Nobody really cares about anything else. So that part of the Nazi philosophy, he was all in on as far as killing Jews. 
So the worst part of being a Nazi, he agreed with. So that so the new title, though, the book is coming out in paperback in June with uh, the English publisher. And the English publisher is going to go with my title now, Storm in the Land of Rain. So I'm happy about that. And uh, the subtitle is A Mother's Dying Wish Becomes Her Daughter's Nightmare. Uh-huh. And they're also going to put the word That's memoir. Also very good. Yeah. I like it too. I like this one better. And they're also yeah. going to put the word memoir on there because I get a lot of Lithuanians saying, why are you getting so personal in the story? You know, why are you talking about this? And why are you talking about that? I'm like, it's a memoir. <laughs> okay, so let me, um, there are a lot of questions. I, I'm not going to have time. We have only, uh, we have less than 15 minutes to go. So let me um, turn to, the, there are a lot. Um, so I'm gonna have to be fairly selective. I apologize to those whose questions I won't be able to get to. But um, how did you finally come to terms with the truth about your grandfather? That that we dealt with, but you can say more if you wish. Are you angry at him? Have you forgiven him? How do you assess his uh, role in the struggle for independence? Well, um... I ended up going to Lithuania in 2013 to finally conduct my own research. So it was, you know, feet on the ground and I interviewed a lot of people and I talked to my relatives and I really constructed his story of what he did uh, in Plunga and a little bit of what he did in Telshe. Like really, I could have had two or three more chapters on what he did in Telshe, but I I didn't. I really concentrated on Plunga and I concentrated uh, on Shaole. Uh, But between the three cities, he definitely was involved in murdering 8,000 Jews and uh, up to 15,000 Jews, if you want to count the actual city of Shaole, which was under the the purview of the mayor and not necessarily the governor. But um, after my trip in Lithuania, I came home. It's funny, I came home after that seven-week trip. And a friend of my mother called me and asked me to to talk to some Lithuanian organization about my grandfather. And I said, well, you know what? I just came back from a trip to Lithuania. And now I'm my story about my grandfather would be how he played a role in killing Jews in the Holocaust. Do you still want me to speak? <laughs> no, Sylvia, may, maybe not. It's not a good idea. <laughs> so uh, how do I feel about my grandfather now? I'm really angry. I'm angry. You know, he is held up as a hero and it's completely unclear how many Lithuanians he actually saved from the communists. It's completely unclear. And, um, but it's, you know, the his role in killing Jews, there's so much evidence. There's so much evidence. There, there were live witnesses. Then he moved into, the thing that really clinched it for me, funny enough, is that he moved into a house formerly owned by Jews while he was in Palunga for six weeks. For some reason, that last detail really clinched it for me. Uh, and, you know, then I hear, now there's a big campaign in Lithuania of how he saved Jews. Uh, not just in Palunga, but also in Shole. And, um, the saving Jew thing, if I could address it, uh, I think he was very passive. He has some friends. One was a very good fr- fr- friend of the family, Father uh, Boravichos. I think his friends in Shole wanted to save Jews, and they told my grandfather about it. And you know what he did? He said, okay, save your Jews. So, But at the, at the same time, I don't think they knew he was what kind of documents he was signing and what kind of what was happening with the you know with the other Jews I don't think they knew how large his role was in that and uh so he very passively played a role in I don't know saving 10 Jews but he rather actively played a role in killing 8,000 so it's kind of like the slave owner here you know who had uh his favorite slaves in the house and yet at the same time you know was quite cruel to all kinds of other slaves so you can you can be both 
Okay, let me, um, there's a questioner who wants to know, um, how do you think the Soviet occupation in 1940-41 affected the subsequent um, willingness of Lithuanians to collaborate with the Germans? It was huge. That was huge because that uh, angered many Lithuanians, made them very scared, made them very desperate. And that led to uh, the massive hysteria of getting rid of all communists. And of course, that's where the Nazi propaganda machine steps in and says, every single Jew is a communist. So that just gave license to Lithuanians who were not thinking straight to kill every single Jew, including the babies and the grandmothers. But, but uh, underneath it all was this anti, strong anti-Semitic feeling because there were some Lithuanian communists that are, somehow Lithuanians could forgive if they were Lithuanian. If you're Lithuanian and a communist, we could forgive that. But if you're Jewish and maybe a communist, that we can't forgive. So that's where the anti-Semitism goes in. And, uh, you know, this is where they kill the woman and the babies because they're going to grow up to be kind, you know, you know, it was just they, any excuse they could come up with in their head to kill a Jew. But what that so that first Soviet occupation where they sent, you know, so many Lithuanians to Siberia was horrible, but they also sent many Jews to Siberia, too, which is not really brought up. Yes, yes, there were mass deportations to Siberia, uh, that is to the Gulag from all three of the Baltic countries. Um, I, I know the uh, percentages in Latvia better than I do in Lithuania, but my, my father's family who were Latvian Jews um, were among those deported to, uh, to the Gulag and almost none of them made it back alive. Um, there, you know, the, survival rate among them was just as bad as though they'd been shipped to the Nazi um, extermination camps. The, the, uh, the, in Latvia, the number, the percentage of Jews was disproportionately high among those deported. Um, it was about 15%, even though they were only about 5% of the population. And um, I suspect that it was similarly, it was somewhat similar in Lithuania, partly because it, it, it doesn't seem that they were deported because they were Jews. It seems they were deported because they were middle class. And because Jews tended to be disproportionately represented in the middle class in Lithuania as well, I suspect that that may have also resulted in um, similar uh, proportions there. Um, but there's no question the Soviet occupation was a horrible experience for everyone, um, Lithuanians, Jews, and others, uh, Russians in the, in the area too, although there were very few Russians at that time. Um, so anyway, let me, uh, let me get back. There's also a questioner who has another question about your mother that um, is fairly interesting. She thinks, that, uh, at least this questioner, and suspects that your mother had guessed the truth and was reluctant to write the book herself because she worried about the reaction, but thought that you too would get to the truth and may have wanted you to write the book because she thought you would uh, actually do it. Um, do you think there's any basis to that? I don't know, maybe subconsciously. I don't think, I don't think consciously it was there. That's just my sense of it. I think she was just, because we were pretty close toward the end, you know, I was already 38 and she was 60 and, you know, we would go to the opera together and, you know, hang out by this point. So I think she would have told me if she, if she had known, I, that's my feeling. Mm -hmm. I don't think she would have hidden that from me, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I still, I think when she gave me the story, she expected me to write the heroic story. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. So do, do you, um, how, what do you think should happen to that school that's named after your grandfather? They should name it 
uh, after someone else, maybe after someone who actually saved some Jews. You know, there's 900 Lithuanians, according to the Yad Vashem, uh, who actually played a role in saving Jews. Uh, so it should be one of those 900 to me. Mm -hmm. Can you, here's another question from the audience. Can you comment on the role of historical memory in Lithuania more generally, not only about that um, experience, that is the experience both on the Soviet occupation and the, the um, Nazi occupation, but also more generally um, about the subsequent Soviet occupation and how that historical memory um, can be can be brought uh, more into line with the actual events that happened. Um, so is, is there an opportunity at this point to shape historical memory in Lithuania or is it still too early? I think there is an opportunity to shape it, uh, partly because of this book and partly because people are finally actually talking about the Holocaust. Uh, most Lithuanians were never even talking about the Holocaust before. Uh, you know. Most Lithuanians talked about the Soviet occupation. That's the one that hurt them the most. And uh, that's, you know, I, I have lots of people who always came up to me and say, Lithuanians who come up to me and say, but what about the Soviet occupation? Why don't you talk about that in your book? And I'm like, because every other Lithuanian book talks about the Soviet occupation. This is a book that actually talks about the Holocaust occupation. And it's already 400 pages long. So, uh, the Soviet occupation has been covered. It's covered. This is new territory. And I'm a journalist. This is new. So this is the news to me. It was not news to me of how horrible the Soviets were to Lithuanians. That I grew up with my, with my mother's milk. Uh, I had no idea about the Holocaust. So historical memory, uh, part of the reason is the Soviet occupation called Jews Soviet citizens. So during the Soviet occupation, the Soviets themselves did not even talk about the Jews or call it a Holocaust. If it was anything, it was the fight against all Soviet citizens. And so there was no differentiation between the Jewish experience and the, and the you know, Soviet Russian communist experience. So I think that helped with the whitewash too, or contributed to it. Mm -hmm. Have your have your high school students read the book or read your earlier articles about your grandfather? Yeah. Um, well, the book came out in March, so I was teaching then. But before that, you know, I would have articles out, and I was on interviews, and I would stop class, and I would say, "Do you want to go over vocabulary, or you want to hear Miss Fody on uh, BBC Radio?" <laughs> so, uh, so. They heard it, and then we talked about it. Uh, so I definitely uh, brought it up with them quite often, and I think it's exciting for students to have a teacher who like actually wrote a book and is not just talking about other books. So um, I was able to bring in my own lessons that way too. Okay, let me um, because we're rapidly running out of time. Let me turn to one final question from the audience, um, which is the role of younger people, the younger generation. That is, I, I'll just define it um, as under thirty in um, you know people who uh, were born just as the Soviet Union was breaking apart, or or after. Um, so the uh, how do you assess their role in seeking a more comprehensive, in Lithuania, I should add, <laughs> um, a more comprehensive understanding of Lithuania's history, including the dark history of the Holocaust? Do you think, have you detected um, interest among younger, the younger generation in Lithuania in trying to come to terms with the past? Um. I don't know. You know, there's some young, very young Lithuanians uh, who who are really against me in Lithuania. They're they're the they seem to be the most vocal uh, and the loudest about it. Um, I don't know. I guess I don't live there, so 
I don't have a good sense of it. Uh, generally, there was just complete indifference to the Holocaust and this issue. And if they go public about it, they tend to go against what I'm trying to say. This whole new side of uh, Lithuanians' role in the Holocaust. They they don't like to really uh, explore it. Is my sense of it. I hope that changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Let me um, thank you very much, Sylvia, for such a, a um, very difficult um, and troubling the coming to uh, terms yourself with such a difficult and troubling experience. Um, event um, and relative, um, but also in presenting it so well and in what must have been also extremely difficult for you. It's recounted in the book, but um, just thinking uh, you know, how, how agonizing it must have been as you were beginning to realize the truth about what had happened. So let me um, commend you for that and in presenting it so, so uh, eloquently both in the book and today in the seminar. Let me um, allow you to finish by uh, providing the new title that will be coming out in English, um, which I actually like better, uh, the both the new title and the new subtitle and, and also in Lithuanian. So the new title of the paperback will be Storm in the Land of Rain. And the subtitle, uh, Mother's Dying Wish Becomes Her Daughter's Nightmare. Excellent. And now in Lithuanian. Vetra Lieto Shalia. And I, I don't know what their subtitle is. They just took they took the storm, they took the storm in the land of rain, but I don't know what subtitle they're gonna take. Okay, okay, excellent. Very good. Let me thank you very much. And um there will be another um, Sakharov seminar coming up next month, but they were, we're off to an excellent start. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Thank you, Mark.